Hello, and welcome to the Nursing World Shared Practice Forum. My name is Sarah Gibbons, and I am the Senior Director for Clinical Education, Informatics, Quality, and Practice, and the Chief Nursing Informatics Officer at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Lynn Gallagher-Ford. Lynn is Senior Director and Clinical Core Director of the Helene Fold Institute for EBP and Clinical Associate Professor, College of Nursing, all at The Ohio State University, where her work is dedicated to research, education, and consultation focused on the development, promotion, integration, and implementation, and sustainability of evidence-based practice in both academic and clinical settings. Lynn's clinical background in maternal child health and nursing administration spans 30 years. She served in a variety of roles ranging from bedside clinician to chief nursing officer in which she gained extensive experience and expertise in teaching and implementing evidence-based practice in real-world clinical settings. She co-edited the book, Implementing the EBP Competencies in Healthcare, A Practical Guide for Improving Quality, Safety, and Outcomes. Her publications include co-authorship of multiple studies that have dramatically impacted the current body of knowledge about evidence-based practice and influenced strategic imperatives to address new challenges. She also contributed as a lead author in the American Journal of Nursing EBP series, which received the Sigma Theta Tau Publication Award for 2011. She serves as assistant editor of World Views on Evidence-Based Nursing and is the editor of the column Implementing and Sustaining EBP in Real-World Healthcare Settings, which features best evidence-based strategies and innovative ideas on how to promote and sustain evidence-based practices and cultures in clinical organizations. She was inducted into the National Academies of Practice and the Nursing Academy as a Distinguished Practitioner and Fellow in 2013, and the American Academy of Nursing as a Fellow in 2017. Lynn, welcome. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. All right, let's get started. So despite an aggressive research movement, the majority of findings from research often are not integrated into practice, with it taking almost 17 years for research findings to be translated into practice. Research is perceived to be inaccessible, incomprehensible, mm -hmm. and irrelevant to daily practice of clinicians. How do we change that? So you're right. Uh, we do have this gap that exists between research being made available through uh, our publications and it actually translating to the bedside. So that has uh, been been the case for, for a long time and we haven't been able to really move that uh, too much. Um, so that really is the foundation of evidence-based practice, is how do we get that research off the shelf and, and delivered to the bedside? And so that is literally the underpinning of evidence-based practice. So how do we do that? And how we do that is through a combination of teaching people what they need to know to be able to go find the evidence, which is the research, read it, be comfortable with it, and uh, make sense out of it, and then bring it into practice. Uh, so the, 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 the things we need to do are educate people, give them tools, mentor them, help them learn how to access things. So that takes care of inaccessible because accessing them is writing a good PICO question and reaching out to your librarians to help with accessing them. Incomprehensible is a perception, you know, and I think that people really do need to practice reading the literature again, be mentored through reading the literature again, not feeling like I have to understand all of this on my own and that there is, you know, uh, expert help available. And irrelevant, that one, that one's a little harder to figure out, but um, irrelevant is, I think irrelevant is a word that's used because they haven't done the other two pieces. So it's a combination of educating people, giving them the skill sets, knowing where to find resources to help them to get really good at it and, you know, and bringing mentoring and, and coaching um, in this new way of, of doing practice. What are the critical components of an EBP culture and how does a healthcare institution go about creating that culture? So we know from the science that we've brought to studying EBP um, that there are some really essential things that if you put them into place, your chances of achieving an evidence-based culture are far better. So those things include it needs to be in your mission. Some, somewhere way up high in the organization, having it doesn't need to say we do EBP here, but it does need to say something about we are evidence-based in our care, we are, you know, doing practice that's based on evidence. Something in the mission has to speak to the fact that we do things this way. Um, so if it's in your mission, uh, it it helps so, so that when people are behaving in a way that doesn't look like that, you can say, how does this behavior match with the mission, right? So having that very high level commitment organizationally is really critical. 
Uh, another thing is having EBP mentors. So um, people that are within the organization who understand what EBP is, why it's important, how do they get people to believe in why it's important. They People that have the skill set, that know what the steps of EBP is or the model of EBP that you're using, and how do they uh, manage change? Because EBP is a change. It's a change for the organization, and it's a change for individuals. So it's behavior change and organizational change. Um, there, uh, the other things we need to have include resources. So you can't do EBP unless you have computers, access to librarians, access to nurse scientists in some way, and just stuff. So most places do pretty good with stuff, you know. But there are lots of places that we go that really don't have access to libraries or they don't have a librarian. That's a real challenge. So we have to help organizations with things like that. Um, recognition of EBP work and EBP successes is really critical. And then the other one that is super critical is leadership support. Um, and so it leaders create culture. Leaders set the culture. They can't get out of that. That is just the way it is. So how do we help leaders to understand what EBP is and what can it bring to the organization? And how do we help them to understand how important it is so they can lead it in a way that's really effective? So the only way that you can build an EBP culture is if you have leaders creating an EBP culture and a place where EBP can, as I say, arrive, survive, and thrive, because <laughs> those are three different things. So those are some of the key things that we know are absolutely critical in order to have a culture of EBP. There's the culture you need, and there's readiness. So some things are about being ready. We're ready. We have the stuff. We have these things. But if you don't have the culture that allows all those ready things to happen, then you still don't get there. So you have to be ready and you have to build the culture. I'd like to stop for a minute now and ask the viewers around the world a question. When you answer, could you please leave your city and country location? The question is, what are the strengths and weaknesses in your organization related to building a culture of EBP? As you answer, also identify ways that you could leverage the strengths and mitigate the weaknesses. So you just mentioned mentors. Tell me about EBP mentors and why they're so critical to the to a strong EBP culture. So mentors are um, in the model that uh, I'm most familiar with and the one that we teach, which is the ARC model that Byrne Melnick and Ellen Finout Overholt have developed. It's an organizational model. You know, it's it's more about how do you create an EBP organization. And the critical piece of that model that we have tested is um, is the role of the mentor. It is the central core of it. And that is that there are these folks that are in the organization that really do have this, this skill set of being able to help others in EBP. And what we have found is in our study of the places where we've helped to develop these mentors and then measure their effectiveness and what do they do, what mentors do is they change people's beliefs. And when you change people's beliefs in EBP in two ways, one is I believe EBP is important and I believe we can do it here. Both have to happen. That's what mentors do. And when mentors do that and they change beliefs, what we see in, our, in the science is beliefs drive implementation. So mentors increase beliefs and beliefs drive implementation. And implementation of EBP drives patient outcomes, organizational outcomes, return on investment, and all those sort of things. So that's why mentors, although they... A lot of people call a lot of people mentors. This is very specific. These are people who we teach the skill set to and teach them about how do you work with people to do organizational change. And when you specifically create EBP mentors, that's what we see happen. And we've measured it, and it really does make a big difference. So that's really interesting. It almost seems like you don't have to be an EBP expert to be an EBP mentor, that really the people that are going to excel at this are champions and change agents. So how does an institution who doesn't have a strong EBP foundation identify people who would be good EBP mentors? It's a great, great question because it's it's really both. You know, the when I'm when I'm looking for who do I want to be the EBP mentors, and it's those it's those people who are really curious, people who really are you know passionate about doing the right thing and figuring out why do we do it this way and why. Those are the people you go for, and then we can teach them the skills. 
you know, but it's the champion, it's the passion, it's the, it's the believing part that that's hard to build in somebody. So you go find those people who are passionate about best practice and really doing the right thing. And then we give them the skill set. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not so much, uh, because the skill set really is not that hard to teach people, quite frankly. I mean, we, you have to learn it if you haven't learned it before. And you can get really, really good at it by practicing it. We call it evidence based practice, 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 because you have to use it to get good at it. But you're right. And uh, the, the, one of the critical things that an EBP mentor does is facilitate it, cheerlead it, role model it, encourage it. That's part of mentoring. Uh, you know, helping others to see the light about why it's important and helping others get good at it. So it really is a combination of the two things. And it's easy, it's way easier to teach somebody who's a rock star how to, what the skills are than to have somebody who's got the skill set and try to figure out how to make them feel it, you know? So it really is a combination. That's a really key point, I think, for institutions who you know, might be worried about how to start this process. Right. Just find people that are excited and, yes. and leverage that. The Absolutely. skills will come. I'd like to ask our audience another question. When you reply, please leave your city and country location. The question is, if you were to create an EBP mentor development program at your organization, what roles and characteristics would you look for in your prospective mentors? Organizational culture seems to be really important. Mm -hmm. And a philosophy of this is the way we've always done it, seems to be a large barrier to implementing EBP and something that I think a lot of institutions face. How yeah. can they tackle it? So you see my button, I which do. is because we've always done it that way with a line through it. I say EBP is the cure for that. Um, but you're right. It is very much the traditional way that people answer the question, why do we do it this way? And oftentimes the answer is because we've always done it that way. And that has been for years the, an okay answer. And so it's that's the beginning of the culture change is that that answer doesn't make any sense. And uh, but but organizations have to be ready to take that on. Um, and until you're really ready to take that on and say that's not a good enough answer anymore, you're not ready for EBP. So then I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done around the EBP competencies. What was the impetus for those and what approach did you take for their development? So the impetus, first of all, was uh, that they didn't exist. Um, there have there has been some, you know, obviously a lot of people working on competencies, and there had been some work done on competencies for faculty to teach EBP, but there had not been any um, study of or try, effort to try to create competencies for what should we be looking for in nurses actually in practice. And so it was a gap. And so when there's a gap, you do research. And so we did what's called a Delphi study, which is uh, uh, Byrne and Ellen, when they were at Arizona State, they assembled a group of EBP experts who had like an expert panel, and they generated a set of what they thought were the essential competencies for uh, nurses, and both practicing bedside nurses and advanced practice nurses. And then we did a Delphi study, which is a a uh, methodology where you seek consensus from uh, people outside of that expert group. So we then sent that we wrote up those competencies and then we sent them out to people in the real world uh, who were doing EBP in hospitals and other healthcare settings and said, how did these sound to you? Is this realistic? Are these essential? Are, and are they easy to read and are they measurable and some of those other things? And so then we got feedback from those folks with some tweaks, and then we redid them with the tweaks, and then we sent them back out and said, so in a second round of the Delphi study, and then we got answers back until we reached a uh, consensus on what the experts thought and what the real world people thought. And then that was where, that's how we ended up with the competencies. And, and now we've done, we just completed a national study of nurses across the United States. And where are we at with the EBP competencies uh, amongst nurses in the, in the United States study included about 2,300 nurses, and we just published that data. And sad to say, we're not where we need to be, but now we can measure, you know, where we're at. And so that's that's the beauty of it is we're not just wondering, we're starting to get some science around it. And now that you have these results, mm -hmm. how, how do we get there? Well, the competencies, quite frankly, um, particularly the ones for practicing registered nurses, they are not, um, they are not dependent on 
what level of degree you have or when you got your degree. Basically, if you're touching a patient in my hospital, you know, these are the, this is what means you're competent in, in evidence-based practice. So they include things like asks, you know, has clinical inquiry. That is not a hard uh, competency to achieve. It just means you're aware, you're alert, you're taking in the environment you work in, and you're able to say, gee, I wonder, fill in the blank. So they are not um, necessarily that, some of them are, are inherent and just a matter of creating a culture where we invite those behaviors, which is, you're, please ask questions. Uh, please bring your issues forward. Uh, and then the ones for practicing registered nurses are, are mostly all participates in, participates in, participates in. They're not taking the lead on EBP, but they're knowledgeable about it. They know what it is, and they are engaged in it in their own clinical practice. And then the set for the advanced practice nurses, they are much more the drivers. They're those mentors. They're the one, they're doing the comprehensive searching. They're integrating them. They're running teams, interdisciplinary teams. They're really taking the lead on sort of the heavy lifting. So very different in uh, sort of the action verbs for each group. But um, so people are using them in all kinds of ways to really integrate them into lots of different structures in the organization. And that's, for me, that's the goal of creating the competencies, is that it's a tool for clinicians and it, and leaders to use. I'd like to stop for a minute now and ask the viewers around the world a question. When you answer, could you please leave your city and country location? The question is, what are some ways that the EBP competencies could be implemented at your organization? So given that uh, the work seems like it should be something that's done by any registered nurse in an institution, is this something that the schools of nursing are or should be engaging in? Yeah, yeah. So we uh, at the Fold Institute, we have um, different core sets of work. So I am the, you know, kind of senior director of the whole thing, but my my work is mostly working with clinical organizations and going out and working with real hospitals and healthcare systems, which is my favorite thing. But we also have what is called our academic core. And the whole function of that core is to work with faculty and or, you know, universities, interprofessional, because interprofessional education around EBP is what we should be doing. It is a shared competency. We should be teaching it together. It's a beautiful thing to teach all clinicians together. Um, so we're teaching faculty what it is because sometimes they don't know what it is either because they never learned it either. So what is EBP? How do you take your old your old course and you know make it new? And how do you integrate evidence based practice activities into every course? So in your theory course, how do you ask them to write a PICO question? In your you know public health course, how do you ask them to do you know utilize PubMed or whatever? So a lot of faculty are using those competencies as their thing to measure at the end of their undergraduate course. That have we t have we created EBP competent graduates? And then in some of the masters and DNP programs now they're integrating those advanced practice. EBP competencies to say in our master's or our DNP, did we create that advanced practice, that advanced EBP clinician? So they work both in the academic side and on the practice side. And um, so what's happening is we're starting to see more and more new grads coming into the system who are EBP competent. So you mentioned there being different competencies for registered nurses and advanced practice nurses. Right. Why is that? Well, we originally tested them on uh, registered practicing bedside staff nurses and then people who had advanced degrees, you know, APNs, nurse practitioners, et cetera. Um, and what we have found is in, in as people are implementing them, what we're seeing is people are utilizing them more for people who they have asked to be in, an, in advanced roles related to EBP. So depending on who you want to be your drivers of EBP, uh, they're the ones that you would then be able to integrate those EBP competencies for those folks. So I want to change gears a little bit. I want you to tell me more about the Fold EBP Classroom. What are the strengths of the program? So we, for the last six years that we've been at Ohio State, uh, when we were CTEP, which was the Center for Transdisciplinary Evidence-Based Practice, but now that we're the Fold Institute, we... Um, we are doing much of the same work, but we have a new name. Um, so what we do is we teach a five-day, we call it an immersion, 
in EBP, and it is, it's an intense uh, five-day course. It's like a graduate-level course in a week. It's really intended to uh, create EBP mentors. So we, uh, we spend a little bit of time talking about, like I said, getting them you know, fired up about why it's important, and then we get right into writing PICO questions, teaching them how to search, showing, you know, bringing in the librarians to work with them, uh, introducing them to all the tools that we have relative to be able to quickly, critically appraise literature, synthesizing it, making recommendations. So everything you need to know about doing an EBP project, the seven steps, regardless of what model you use, we love all models, you know, uh, whatever model works for you is, is a great fit for EBP projects. And then we also spend time talking to them about mentoring others. So we do some skill building related to change and behavior change and resistance and all the kinds of things that you will run into as a mentor when you're trying to turn things in a different direction. And by the end of the week, every person has an EBP project that they, they're not done because they don't have time to read everything in a week, but they usually read about five articles. And so they have a, a chance to use all the tools and put them together. And then they have the beginnings of what they believe will be, what their recommendations so far. And they do a PowerPoint presentation on Friday to each other. And then we have posters and they disseminate their findings and they go back to their organization with an action plan for an EVP change. And then what we do is we do a lot of things related to people who've attended to keep connected. So we do webinars every month and a lot of places we go back and um, continue to work with, with places. So it's a matter of, so it's really creating EBP mentors in a week, uh, but there's a lot of other pieces that go with that that we try to then stay connected so that people, you know, have, so we continue to mentor the new mentors, right? Um, so that's what happens with anybody that comes to our program. We run them in Columbus at Ohio State. But what we've really started to do is we take them on site. And so we, we go to an organization and they put 50 or 100 people in a room, whoever they believe needs to be their EBP rock stars. And we do the program right on site. And then a lot of places then we, we you know, contract to stay in touch. We go back every three months check on how everybody's doing, how are all the projects going, are we measuring outcomes, what's the return on investment, are, you know, all the projects. We make sure that the projects get done and that the skills are reinforced. So it seems like this could have a real impact on employee engagement and staff satisfaction. Have you seen that with the institutions that you've worked with? Yes. So what we tend to do with the organizations that we have this sort of longer commitment with is we do a research study for them, with them, and we measure a bunch of EBP attributes longitudinally. So beliefs and implementation and organizational readiness and the competencies before the immersion, at the end of the week, three months later, and a year later. And then we also look at things. We have some mentoring questions we ask them. We ask them about job satisfaction. We ask them about teamwork. So we have a bunch of other questions that we ask about all these kind of things. And so what we can do is we look at them over a year and we say, did we move any of those things? And so what we found is that Although that's not why we're teaching these EBP skills, is not to necessarily drive those outcomes, but are they happening anyway? And what we find is, yes, we move people on all these things, beliefs and more implementation, and their competencies are far different than the national numbers. And what we also find is things like satisfaction is improved, engagement is improved, teamwork is improved, communication is improved, intent to stay by the people you want to stay, which is good. Um, you know what I mean? So we measure all those things too. And what we have seen over, you know, the years that we've measured it is it drives those things too. And engagement's a big deal, you know? And so you can't really do this, what I'm asking people to do, unless you're engaged. Because the first step of evidence-based practice is What's your clinical inquiry? What are you wondering about? What's driving you crazy? What are the things you see happen differently on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? And if you don't see that there's a question in that, you're disengaged. So engagement is something that we need for EBP and that we see we get with EBP. So you said something about the PICO questions I thought was interesting. You said, mm. what drives you crazy? And I, right. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that <laughs> it, when thinking about PICO questions. So do you think that's where you should start? Yes. Uh, so this is clinical inquiry. That's the official name for it, clinical inquiry. And they, some places have called it, what's your crazy maker? They literally say they have like a crazy maker campaign. It's, it's how do you, uh, you know, kind of get 
inquiry started. So yeah, it should be the things that are um, nagging at you because the thing is when you're going to take on a project, you need to be passionate about it because searching can be tricky. Uh, You know, some steps along the way can be hard and you have to be able to know uh, the question and or the thing that's driving you crazy because sometimes the Pico question that you start with I always say to people, you can't change your Pico. You can't give it a walk. You can't say, oh, I'm good. I don't want to do that Pico question anymore because I don't like what I'm finding. But Pico questions are your search strategy. That's the function of a Pico question, to take the thing you're wondering about and put it in a format that you can search with. And sometimes you don't have it exactly right the first time, but you have to be passionate about your inquiry. Thank you. Do you think it's important to have buy-in from leadership or key stakeholders about the Pico question and the potential results? Before you start that sort of train of inquiry? I think it's a great idea. Um, Yeah. Because the more you have them engaged early on, uh, the more likely you are to have them engaged at the end. So I'm of the uh, mind of not not too many surprises for leaders and (laughs) key stakeholders. So having the conversation early about the shared crazy maker and making sure that what I'm wondering about is what you're wondering about. And what I'm going to go try to find the answer to is something we're all wanting the answer to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and whatever I find, everybody's going to be okay with the answer. That's why we have to be very careful about how we write Pico questions. And you can't, uh, put any, like you can't write a Pico question with a biased direction in it. You know, you can't say, how does this compare to that improve this thing? Because you want it to improve this thing. We have to write them in the way that they're very, you want to see what all the evidence is. So what advice would you give to someone who's gone through the process and found the evidence, but has met with, (laughs) well, that won't work on our unit? Well, so that wouldn't be the first time I heard that sentence. Um, So I guess for me, it would be um, helping, you know, having a conversation about help me understand why. Um, so some of what we, what I think is really important to, to teach EBP mentors or EBP uh, junior mentors or EBP rock stars is what are you going to do with these kind of statements? Because you're going to get them. And so some of it is pro- is uh, being proactive to say, what are you going to say when you take it out to your unit and they say, well, that won't work on our unit. Our patients are different than that. Our patients are too sick. And so the main thing I would advise people is be prepared, have your answer ready, because when you don't be, don't be shocked because then you won't come, have a good answer. So think about it ahead of time and then engage the, the resistance, engage the resistance to say, help me understand why you're saying that. Because you're going to be bringing the change with a whole lot of evidence to support you, 15 articles or, you know, whatever of everybody else that tried this. It worked everywhere else. So help me understand what you, what you think or what you feel is the reason it won't work here. You got to engage that resistance and you have to be prepared for it and understand how do you going to, you know, where's that coming from? Who's it coming from? How are they connected to the way we've always done it? And, um, you know, some of letting go of the way we've always done it shows up in lots of different ways because the thing that people, the thing that drives resistance to change is fear. That's what it, it's fear. So what do you, You don't have to say, what are you afraid of? But that's really what you do have to get at is help me understand what's holding you back or why you think this won't work or how can we work together to move through it. But the the thing you need to have people say is we're going to have to find a way. So you mentioned the connection between EBP and quality improvement. So how do we ensure that EBP research and quality improvement are connected? That's a great question, and it's uh, it's one of the things we're str- a lot of places struggle with. I think of it this way. All things start with a question, and then you kind of pour it through the EBP funnel where we look to see if there's any evidence to help us answer the question. And if what comes out the bottom of the funnel is, yes, there is a robust body of evidence that says, you're right, you are doing it wrong. Here's what you should do differently. Do that. That's evidence-based practice. That one's nice and easy, right? And then have your QI people pick up this best practice and make sure we're doing it great. So see that nice flow. If what comes out the bottom of the funnel is there's really not a clear answer out there. It's not fully developed yet. There's a little bit of information, but not quite, we're not quite comfortable that we know what to do differently. Then you, you're, you are compelled to reach out to your nurse scientist colleagues, wherever they are and say, can you help us with 
developing a research study about this because we just identified that there's a clear gap in knowledge. That's what research is, addressing a gap in knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was really wonderful. Uh, It's been great to be here. I really, really appreciate the opportunity.